Well, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to our Wednesday afternoon Bible study and prayer time. Uh, I'm so glad to see you. We're back in the office again. Um, it's so good to, I hope all of you that are tuning in via Facebook or the internet uh, have a pretty clear picture of what's going on. I uh, hope you will look at the, the first video that I sent uh, so that you can have an idea of what's going on. But but welcome to Bethesda Baptist Church. Uh, we just happen to be Bethesda Baptist Church uh, online. And so uh, we're glad you're able to be here with us. I'm going to run through a few prayer requests real quickly. Again, I will only use the first names. Uh, those of you all who are the members here, you know who I'm talking about. Um, and certainly, if you have a prayer request that you'd like to have added to this list, uh, if you please just send that thing straight on either to me or, or Miss Carol uh, so that we can get it incorporated in next week's list uh, of prayer requests. Start with, we have uh, Mr. Uh, LB uh, and then uh, Miss Vicki. And of course, always Shirley and Roger. Uh, from what I, I've talked to them last week and, and Miss Shirley is recovering. Uh, of course, you know, it's going to take a little while. It's slow. Uh, but be very much in prayer for them. And then Brother Jimmy, Brother Jimmy is still in the hospital. Uh, you know what I'm saying? He does appear to be recovering, but uh, uh, again, let's continue to lift him up. And then, of course, his sister-in-law, Miss Sandra, we need to remember her as well. I think she's still struggling with that condition that she has. Uh, matter of fact, when I was talking to Jimmy in the hospital, he said that she actually uh, did have a spell. So, uh, uh, you know, while she was on her way to the hospital. Of course, then Molly and Bill, naturally we want to remember them. And uh, Maria and Andrew. Uh, and, of course, Blake is still recovering. Uh, the Lopez, Jones, and Paul families. Uh, and Miss Angela, and of course, Jim, uh, Miss Pat will be, uh, continue to pray for him. I'm sure Miss Pat will, is very concerned about his health and that him getting better. Uh, of course, Miss Carla and then Furl, uh, and then of course, uh, John and Linda and Miss Norma are, are traveling to Michigan. They'll be gone for, I want to say a couple of months. So, so be much a prayer for them. They'll have travelers mercy. Again, as always, let us remember Miss Carol. Uh, she's still struggling with what she believes to be pollen, uh, but, you know, it's just very uncomfortable. Uh, so be much in prayer for her that God will touch her body and heal her. Uh, and, and I've got a couple that I, I need to add or that we need to be conscious of. One is our nation. We need to be conscious of our nation. We need to be praying for our leaders, not just our church leaders, but all the leaders. Uh, uh, they're having to make some very hard decisions. We need to pray for the folks uh, who have businesses. Uh, some of them are struggling right now, uh, you know what I'm saying? especially with uh, food services and things like that where they can only do carry out or or you know pick up. They cannot do and you know anything inside the the facility, you know what I'm saying, because I just don't want people to congregate. Uh, we have got so many that we need to be lifting up. We need to be asking for God's intervention. Remember uh, Miss Nancy. Miss Nancy fell the other week. Uh, there was more damage to her, uh, the bone at the base of her thumb uh, than originally was thought. Matter of fact, she's going to have to have a procedure uh, tomorrow, Thursday, uh, it'll be on an outpatient basis, but she's still going to have to have a, th a surgery with some plates and uh, probably some screws and stuff uh, to hold all that bone together as it heals. So uh, let's not forget Miss Nancy. And, and again, uh, continue to pray for our people, continue to pray for our church uh, and our nation as we go through these difficult times. So will you join me as we open this Bible study up and as we take these prayer requests uh, to the Lord. Father, we just uh, praise you. We just worship you. We just honor you uh, that we have an opportunity now to come to the throne of grace. Father, that we can bring these petitions uh, before you and that, Father, that uh, as we bring them to you, we know that you're the great physician. Lord, we know you're the God of the Bible. We know that you're the God of healing. And Father, we would pray, Lord, that in each one of those situations, Father, while we haven't mentioned uh, here uh, 
uh, online, Lord, the, the last names. Lord, we know you know them. And Father, I know that most of the people that are listening to this, they know those names. They know those individuals. And Father, we pray, Lord, uh, that you would bless them. We pray, Father, that you would bless them, uh, Lord, and strengthen their bodies. Father, those like Brother Jimmy that are in the hospital, Lord, we pray, Father, that you'd uh, just encourage and strengthen him as he continues to recover uh, and rehab. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you'd be with our church. Father, right now, you know how brokenhearted we are that we cannot meet together. Uh, and Father, I would pray, Lord, that you would draw us uh, through your Holy Spirit together to encourage us and to strengthen us. Father, that even in this most of difficult of times, Father, uh, that we would hold forth the banner of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that we wouldn't see this as a, a problem, but Father, that we would see it as an opportunity, an opportunity to reach those around us, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. Lord, that we would reach out to them. Lord, that we would... Uh, speak words of peace to them and encourage them. Father, to let them know who you are and Lord, what a relationship with you can mean in their lives. Now, Father, we pray, Lord, as we open the words of life, we pray for encouragement. We pray for strength. Father, we just pray, Lord, in these coming days that you'll bless our nation. Lord, thank you for the doctors and the nurses and the first responders. Lord, all the people that are in harm's way right now, uh, helping us and helping this nation to get through this difficult time. Bless them, bless their families, watch over them and keep them safe. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that you'd give our, uh, our leaders wisdom, Lord, as they make decisions that affect us and this nation. Uh, and Father, that Lord, that, that this thing will be short-lived, that, that Lord, we can, maybe by being prudent, maybe we can help uh, the nation to recover as quickly as possible. Now, Father, once again, we ask you to forgive us where we failed you. And Lord, we'll be careful. We'll be very careful to make sure that only the name of Jesus receives all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Because we've asked all of these things in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. And my family said with me, amen. Well, we have been on Wednesday nights studying in the book of Psalms. I'm going to take a little bit of a detour tonight uh, only because the times we're in, the things that we've been facing. Uh, certainly, I, I know that there are people that have voiced to me, uh, certainly not people from the church, but, but other people have voiced to me, uh, where is God in all of this? Where is the Lord uh, in, in, in these very difficult times? And, and, you know, it's funny because we as God's people, uh, we should not only um, anticipate difficult times, we actually should expect them. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So today we're going to look at a passage in the Bible where, where certainly the question could be asked, uh, where's God when the things get tough? Where's he at now uh, as this nation uh, it goes through these very difficult times. Well, I, I think we can learn a lot from the Word of God, certainly everything we need to know uh, about this life and the one to come. And I think that it has some valuable lessons to teach us from the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible, uh, if you'll take them to and take in turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 1, and we'll probably, uh, we'll probably read the first four verses, and then we'll probably uh, read the second uh, all the way through 7 uh, a little bit later on. So, so join me as, as we read God's Word and as you open your copy uh, of the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 4 and verse 1 says, Now there came certain women of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Now, what we need to understand about this situation is, is that, that there was a, a, a school, I guess for lack of a better word, of prophets. Uh, and these folks uh, were the ones uh, that actually studied the Bibles. They were students of the prophets. 
Uh, and this particular lady, uh, whose husband was of the sons of the prophets, uh, has now become a widow. Uh, her husband has passed away, uh, and in so doing, has left her with, with debt. And, and her fear is, is that not that he's just left her with debt, but in the day and time in which they live, uh, it might be very easy for his creditors uh, to come upon her and, uh, and seek the children or the, the, the young men uh, as bond servants in order to pay his debt. And that could last until the year of Jubilee. You know, it, it could be six, seven years. You know, the year of, year of Jubilee occurred once every seven years. Uh, it could be seven years, you know what I'm saying, and, and could wind up anywhere, wherever that person who, who took the debt or the uh, whoever they were indebted to decided to take these young men uh, in order to make uh, slaves out of them. So... If you think about it, not only did they have the debt, but they had no source of income. In other words, they had uh, no food. And, and she knew that they were on their way. Now, you have to understand that in, in, in biblical times, women did not own property. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And as such, uh, could not even inherit property. Now, him being a son of the prophets or in the prophet school, more than likely he didn't own a bunch of property or probably owned no property uh, because he was in uh, the business of listening to the Lord, uh, to learn about the Lord and proclaiming uh, the, the Lord and his statutes. So what she had to worry about was, was it possible that maybe the father had pledged them as uh, indentured servants? Now, she could have done a lot of things in this particular situation. She could have certainly uh, blamed God. And, and in the situation we're in right now, there are people who are blaming God. There are people who are saying that, you know what, uh, uh, our church uh, is more spiritual than somebody else's church simply because we're meeting. Well, what you have to understand is, is that, you know what, what's one, what is right for one congregation may not be right for the other. It doesn't, it, it doesn't show lack of faith by us choosing to heed the warnings, the medical warnings. It simply says, then show that they have more faith by, by coming together. And, and so I want you to understand that, that just like this lady, she could have blamed God. She should have, could have said, God, why did you take my husband away from me? Uh, Lord, why me? I, I, I know I hear that all the time. I'm an expert at, at pity parties. You know, uh, I've even heard a few things on the, uh, the internet and, and on the television about people complaining about uh, cabin fever and not wanting to be, uh, you know, cooked up in their houses and one thing and another. You know, <laughs> We have to understand, you know, that, that these people are not doing this just so that, or telling us this, just so that, for chuckles and grins. These people are telling this for our own benefit, and not only our benefit, but the benefit of our neighbors. And, you know, the Bible said that we're supposed to love our neighbors like we love ourselves. Now, this lady could have blamed God. This lady could have, this lady could have complained, why me? This lady could have even said, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to borrow my way out of it. That seems to be the way we are today, isn't it, in our society, where we come to a point where we think we can borrow our way out of our troubles. But, but she, she didn't do that. I, I mean, what did she do? Well, you know, we have to go to verse 2 uh, of this chapter in order to find out what her actions were to the problem that she was currently facing. It says in verse 2 of chapter 4, And Elisha said unto her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaiden hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Now, when her problem came to light and she began to fully understand exactly what she was facing, it's interesting that the first person that she went to was Elisha. She, she went to the Lord to find a solution to the problem. And, and that's why I said earlier uh, in the introduction video, uh, you know, if there was ever a time that we need to be in prayer, it is now. We need to be, uh, in we need to be seeking God's face 
for what he would have us to do as individuals, as churches, and also as a nation. As a nation to come to a point where we find ourselves on our knees. You know, this virus has, has done much to demonstrate to all of us that we're not in control like we think we are. There are so many people who uh, depend on the economy for their salvation. There are many people that, that think if we have the right candidate uh, or the right political party in office, or if we, if we just have the right government program, that, that somehow we'll be safe. And, and this virus has actually taught us that, you know what, there is no hedge against trouble. There is no, uh, there is no uh, guarantee that we won't face these kind of things. So in knowing that there is no guarantee, then we have to do just like this widow lady did. We have to turn to the Lord. Now, you think about it. Now, while it, there's certainly going to be some economic hard times, while you think about it, it's, it's certainly going to be tough on some people's jobs that, that are not going to be able to go to work for whatever reason. You know, it, this lady lost everything, and her greatest fear was not the material things that she did not have. Her greatest fear was that she was going to lose her children. Her greatest fear was her children were going to be sold into slavery, and all she could do was trust in God. All she could do was go to the one that holds all of her yesterdays, all of her todays, and all of her tomorrows. And in so doing, she would have to walk by faith. So she comes to Elisha and she says, you know what? I, 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 I don't really have a solution to my problem. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 121, verses 1 and 2, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which hath made heaven and earth, even when you don't understand. Matter of fact, actually, let me say this, especially when we don't understand. You know, this verse keeps telling us, keep trusting in him, keep depending on him, keep believing on him, you know, because you have to realize that your help comes from above. Your salvation will not be in another government program. Your salvation won't even be if you can go to the uh, Walmart and be able to buy toilet paper. Your salvation is going to come from above. It's going to come from the Father. And, and that's who we need to look to, and that's who we need to trust in. Now, what can we expect from God throughout all this difficult time? Well, do we believe that God will act on our behalf? Do we really believe? You know, I, I can remember back being in secular employment when, uh, when Y2K came around. Some of y'all may be old enough to remember that. Uh, and, and it was like the sky was falling. Man, people were running around. People were going through very difficult times. And as they were doing that, uh, you know, it was like people, I, I said, why did, if God has blessed this nation up to this point, why all of a sudden does one day make a difference? He's been our God. He's been our Savior. He's been our help in times of trouble. And, and yet, you know, we look at it and we say, you know, will God, will God protect us? Will God act on our behalf? Well, I, I believe he is. And I, and, I, and I have to ask you, you know, really, what are you expecting him to do today? You see, often we don't expect much because we don't really have the right relationship with him. Not only do we not have the right relationship, sometimes I believe we don't really understand who God is. You see, we have to ask ourselves, what are we expecting uh, in these next weeks, months, days that we face this? What are we expecting for God to do, first and foremost, in our own lives? You know, whenever we find ourselves in a difficult situation, the first thing we need to do is examine our own hearts, to examine where we are with the Lord. Is this a call from God? Is this God tapping us on the shoulder and saying, hey, you know, you're not where you need to be? Is this, is this God's way of trying to get this nation's attention? It happened once before, if you'll remember, uh, you know what I'm saying, uh, on September 11th. 
and, and the nation came to its knees when it realized how vulnerable it is. I don't see as much of that in this particular situation as I did then. But, you know, unfortunately, that, that concern was short-lived. And as soon as people no longer were concerned, uh, they kind of quit going to church. They kind of quit worrying about what God would have them to do. So, so what I'm trying to say is this, you know, we need to examine our relationship, you and I, one-on-one -on -one with, with the Lord. And then we need to ask ourselves, what about our families? Are our families in the right place? Are they doing what they should be doing? Mom and dad, are, are you bringing your children to church on a regular basis? Or, or do you kind of just let them fend for themselves or when the ball game's not on or when they don't have practice or when something else in the secular world's not going on, you bring them? How about it, Grandma and Grandpa? What about you? You know, what about your relationship with the Lord? Can your grandchildren see Jesus in you? Can they see that there's an importance in that relationship? Can they look at you and understand who God is? Because they should be able to. Now, now, now think about this for just a second. Think about this woman's problem. She is scared to death. She has nothing. And this is an interesting thing in verse 2 that Elisha makes this statement. He said, uh, what have you got in your house? Well, uh, today, you know, if you ask people, what have you got in your house? The first answer you're going to get is probably very little or no hand soap or, or hand sanitizer and very little or no toilet paper. You know, sometimes we look at what we don't have uh, and we forget all of the things that we've been blessed with. So, so. What he did was he was asking the widow to participate in her own miracle. Now think about that for a minute. He was asking the widow to participate in her own miracle. What I'm trying to say is this, that you know that the tools uh, for God's blessings are, are often already in our possession. The tools for God's blessings are often already in our possession. Some of us have money. You know, some of us, has God has blessed us with the resources uh, to be able to reach out uh, and participate and help others and participate in their miracle. Some of us have talent. You know, it's amazing. I, I, I think about our musicians and the people that come and play and, and, and the, the joy that is on their face. Uh, when they participate, you know why? Because they're using their talents for the Lord. Some of us, some of us have clothes. Some of us have possess. Some of us have words of encouragement. Boy, right now, isn't that something that we could really use as a church? Isn't that something that we could use as a, a, a word? You know what I'm saying? For our neighbor, for the people we love, for our church members. Lord, maybe maybe for those folks who are 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 scared to death. Maybe they don't know where their eternity's at. Maybe they don't have a church home. Maybe they don't they don't have a relationship with the Lord, and they don't know who to trust in or where to turn. Now. Verse 2 tells us, the, the, the widow lady responds, Thine handmaid hath nothing in all her house save a pot of oil. Now, in her mind, that pot of oil wasn't much. And, and you know, it didn't amount to a whole lot. It didn't say what size it was. I'm sure it probably wasn't very large. Uh, she certainly didn't think much of it. But, you know, God is an expert at taking little things and making great things out of them. God takes little and does much. And if we look at that, even in our own lives, you know, I've heard people tell me, uh, especially when it was time to do uh, uh, nominations and classes and teaching or, or fill a position in the church, people would say, well, but, but I don't have this talent. I don't have that talent. Preacher, I don't know how to do that. Well, you know what? God can take that little step of faith and do great things through it. We have great teachers here at Bethesda. And you know what? Every one of them started their journey with the Lord with one step. So, so he was going to take this little thing of oil and was going to make it something great. Now listen to this. This is in verse 3. 
He said, then he said, this is Elisha now, go borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, and borrow not a few. He said, and when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and thou shalt pour into out into all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more, and all the oil stayed. Now, it's interesting because what God is fixing to do here, Elisha tells us, says, look, you need to go out and you need to borrow some vessels, some pots to be able to contain uh, oil. And he said, you need to go out and he says, don't just borrow a few. Don't, don't just borrow one or two. He said, get as many vessels as you can get. Because here's the deal, folks. You know what? Sometimes God has to ask us to act in faith. And sometimes the miracles that we receive are directly proportionate to the amount of faith and trust we put in God. Now, what about this? What if she had went out and said, you know, this is a little pot of oil, you know, and, and God's, you know, he's kind of left me and I don't really know what's going on. I tell you what, dude, uh, how about I just get one or two pots? So what would her blessing have been? Would it have been a, a great miracle or would it have been something much less than what God intended? I'm afraid sometimes that it's much less than what God intends for us simply because we refuse to act in faith. When God says go and take whatever it is we have and use it to his glory and we don't do it, then guess what? We're the ones that are missing out because God is going to accomplish his goals. God is going to accomplish everything that he plans, whether he uses you or not. I can remember years ago at another church, uh, I had a, there was a discussion about whether we tithe on our gross or our net income. In other words, before taxes or after taxes. And my the best response I ever heard to it was this. Well, it depends on what kind of blessing you want. Do you want a gross blessing or do you want a net blessing? It's entirely up to you. And, and I think that that's exactly what he was saying here. Now, now verse 5 tells us that she did exactly what he said. She sent her sons out, they went to their neighbors, and they began uh, to gather up these vessels. Now, I want you to notice something, because this act of faith, this faith produces obedience. I have a lot of people who tell me, oh, preacher, you just don't know. Said, uh, I believe in God, I trust God, but they're not obedient. You know, God is telling them, hey, I want you to do this. I want you to talk to your neighbor. And we say, you know, Lord, I just, I can't do that. Well, you know what? You're not trusting God. Because if you're trusting in what you can do, you will never accomplish for the kingdom what God has intended. And the reason that you won't is because you won't act in faith. You won't act in obedience. When God tells you what he wants you to do, you won't do it because you're afraid that somehow or another you will fail. And if you do it by yourself, if this was just this widow woman, she would have failed. But she wasn't. She was acting on the word of God through Elijah to accomplish a great miracle in her life. You know, faith that fails to obey is not really faith at all. James chapter 2 verse 17 said, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So today, if we say we're going to trust God, then we have to act in faith. We have to believe him. We have to trust him to know that, that he has our best interest at heart. He has our nation's best interest at heart. Do we understand? No. Do you think that this woman, to begin with, actually understood what God was trying to do uh, in her life? 
I don't know. I don't know whether she did or not, but I do know this. I know she acted in faith, and I know that she was obedient. Now, verse 6 says that, you know what? She gathered, her sons gathered up all those pots, and she took that little pot of oil that she didn't think very much of. She took that oil, and she began to fill up these pots. And, you know, <laughs> the number of containers was really a measure of the widow's faith. You know, <laughs> how much she trusted God determined the number of containers. In other words, what she said was, you know, he said, don't get a few. I need a major blessing. I need to be obedient. I need to step out on faith. Now, verse 6 tells us that the supply was what? She still had oil to pour. God's provision is unlimited. God can save, the New Testament tells us, to the very uttermost. In other words, you know what? His provision for his children is only bounded by his ability and his power, which is limitless, which means that his provision to us is limitless. But just like this widow woman, you know, although his provision may be limitless, it's limited by our ability to be able to receive that provision. And I do believe because often because of our lack of faith or, or our lack of obedience, that we shortchange our own selves. God wants to do such a wonderful work in our life. He wants to use this nation to bring glory to his name. But you know, he's not going to use a vessel that's, that's not obedient. He's not going to use a pot that is dirty. And so I think as we as a nation right now should be on our face. We should be on our face saying, Lord, Lord, we, we need you now. We need you more than we've ever needed you. We need your provision. We need to trust you. We need to believe you. Not just now when we need you, but even after this virus is gone or washed through or played out or whatever. Because I can assure you folks, the Word of God tells us this one may get over sooner or later, but you can be assured down the road there's something else. There's something else that's going to bring us to a point of having to trust him. And so we need to understand, you know what? We need to act in faith. We need to, that faith needs to be followed by obedience. You see, sometimes the, the containers that we bring to the Lord, they're not empty. Sometimes they're full of sin. Sometimes, you know, the Bible warns about a nation that forgets God. Sometimes, I wonder sometimes if we're not at that point in our lives, in our nation's history, where we do everything in our opportunity, everything in our power uh, to say that God doesn't exist until something like this is. You see, God's provision is much more sufficient than our needs. Verse 7 says this. He says, Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children on the rest. Now think about this. God's provision was there. God provided not only to pay the debt, which was what she was concerned about, God provided her a living, even after her husband was dead. Not only her, but her children, a living. That's because God's grace, God's provision is sufficient. So, tonight, are we facing a, a challenge? without a solution. Is this virus going to be the, the death knoll for America? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's certainly going to be some tragedies. There's going to be some loss of life, certainly. But you know what? This is not a challenge that doesn't have a solution. And maybe tonight, after you've listened to this Bible study, you're saying, you know, 
there's some other things in my life that I'm facing. And, and maybe they're financial. Maybe they're emotional. Maybe they're spiritual. Maybe there's a need in your life and you're saying, you know what? I just don't know what to do. There, there, there's a problem, a challenge. And, and, and I would ask you to examine that situation. And first and foremost, I would ask you, would you act in faith? And if you act in faith, will you be obedient? Because that faith is going to produce obedience. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to believe him? You know, today it seems that there's nothing but negative on the news. There's nothing but negative uh, in the press. Matter of fact, I actually, I know some people that, that they don't even watch the news anymore. They're so disillusioned with it and it, everything about it is negative. That's man's way of doing things. But you know what? We're God's people. You know, the Bible tells us, Paul told a young preacher over there, and uh, Timothy, uh, one of the books to Timothy, he said, you know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Do we need to be concerned? Do we need to take precautions to protect us? Sure we do. God said that, you know what, we're supposed to be as wise as a serpent, yet harmless as a dove. Now think about that for a minute. God is saying, you know what, we need to be aware of our surroundings. When I think about a serpent, I, I know a lot of people think about the garden, but, but I think about a serpent that doesn't have legs, that can't climb, well, I, that can't fly, doesn't have wings, but yet has the ability to catch a bird who can run and fly. Now, how is that possible? Well, the serpent is aware of his surroundings. The serpent knows what's going on. Now, we're told that our response to knowing what's going on shouldn't be like the world's or like the serpent's. It should be like the dove. We should be the ones. We should be the peacemakers here. We should be the ones speaking words of encouragement, especially to our friends who may not have a relationship with Christ. So, tonight, as you pray through our prayer list, as you maybe watch the evening news, you wonder where God's at. He's here. You wonder how we're going to face this, this challenge that doesn't really seem to have a solution. There's a solution. The solution is found in Jesus. So tonight, I bid you rest, a peaceful night, that you might wake refreshed in the morning, <clears throat> ready to be up and about the Father's business. Know that we love you. Know that if you need anything, you can certainly call me directly on my personal phone, the cell phone. Go to the website, send me an email, whatever you might need. Know that Bethesda stands ready to be that pool of healing that's referenced in the Bible. Take care, my beloved. And again, if I can help you, call me. Join me as we close this time in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word which always brings us encouragement. Father, we thank you, Lord, that while many would say we live in perilous times or, or dire straits, thank you, God, that none of this took you by surprise. Thank you, Lord, that, that you don't even, we know you already know the outcome, even though we don't. And Father, for that reason and many, many more, we can trust you. And we do. We trust you now. Lord, we ask for your blessings upon our church. We ask for your blessings upon our nation. Father, I pray for, for everyone that is hearing this broadcast. Watch over them. Watch over their families. Lord, as, as we hear about this virus spreading, and it inevitably will, Lord, give us courage to trust you, believe you. Lord, to know that you still sit on the throne. And, Father, that we might take all of these, our cares to you. Lord, you said, cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Now be with our sick list. Watch over those, Lord, that are, are shut in. Those that are sick, heal them. And, Father, we'll be sure that only the name of Jesus receives all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Because we've asked all of these things in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. And my family said with me, 
Good night, folks. Rest well.